Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Hello, we are so glad that you can be with us again in our study of Galatians. We're going to start in Galatians 3, and I'm going to read verses 19 and 20, 23 to 25 from the New American Standard Version. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. We move to 23. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Over to you, Ken. This is starting to get more interesting than before. <laughs> Well, Galatians is a very interesting book, and like Romans, it says a great deal about the gospel. Now, we're going to back up a little bit. You've read the key verses we're probably going to spend most of our time on, but we're going to back up to chapter 2, verse 15, and see what leads us up to these verses. Indeed, we are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, who, who, what, kind of, what kind of sort of background is he, is, he, is he referring to here? His own background. He's talking about the, 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 the thinking of Pharisees, isn't he? And Jews, as they are called. Yet we know that a person is put right with God only through faith in Jesus Christ, never by doing what the law requires. We too have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be put right with God through our faith in Christ and not by doing what the law requires. For no one is put right with God by doing what the law requires. In other words, doing what the law requires, it may be a good idea. I mean, who, which one of us thinks it's a good idea to, 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 to start killing people? Do we think it's a good idea to uh, start committing adultery? Do we think it's a good idea to start cursing and swearing? Do we think it's a good idea to start worshiping idols? No, we don't, we don't believe any of those things do us any good. But what Paul is saying here is not, is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? He's saying... These are not the way you earn salvation. You, we can't earn salvation. That's his message. What about the statement that Adventists hold on to a lot? That is that here are the people that keep the commandments and the testimony of Jesus. Yeah. How does that fit into what was just said here? Well, again, the, that's, a, that's a very good question, and we don't have time to discuss Revelation 14 and the three angels' messages right now. But I was, the point I was trying to make just now was that these, I, these commandments may be a good idea. The people who are going to be God's faithful people at the end of time keep the commandments not because they re, think it's a requirement in order to earn salvation, they're keeping the commandments because they believe it's the right thing to do. They want to do what is right because it is right, and they believe that God's requirements are doing what is right. In other words, God's requirement is are right. That's why they do them, because they believe they're right. Well, there are people who have allowed God to put a new heart in, a new heart of flesh into them, mm -hmm. and that's the result of the new heart. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so they're keeping the commandments? Like, they are like keeping Paul the commandments, but not as we can't do? No, he, no he, he he's, they're that. keeping the commandments, but not as a way to earn salvation. That's the key. It's not that there's anything wrong with keeping the commandments. Paul even says, and, and you know, in some places, Paul says, if you could keep all the commandments faithfully, you could be saved by it. You could be saved by keeping the commandments if you could do all of them 
perfectly. So you can't do them all. You can't do them all. So they aren't keeping it perfect, perfectly. They're, they're valuing with the, them. Maybe. With, the hel with the help of God, they're doing their best. Okay. Okay. And, they're, and they're thinking it's joyful and fun to keep the mm -hmm. commandments. They're not thinking it's a burden. Right. And they're doing it because they believe it's the right thing to do. Okay. Not, not, again, as a way to try to earn something. And also the Holy Spirit helped uh, as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and I mean, that's the whole point. The point is, if we do our, our, our Bible study, our prayer, our witnessing, those are the three things that we can do. If we do those things... What we're doing is we're, in, we're, we're basically opening our minds. We're inviting the Holy Spirit to come in and do all those other things that we talk about, the justification, the sanctification, da-da-da-da, like that. We don't do those things. God does those things. But he does it if we give them a chance. It's interesting to look back on Christ's life when he confronted these folks. He was against what they were doing, mm -hmm. the self satisfied uh, acrimonious way they were living yeah he never did really knock the ten commandments and the, toward the end of his life he, he, he narrowed it down to two love God and love your neighbor as yourself yeah uh, which covers it all really yeah. when mm -hmm. you think about it exactly it's true because yeah. if you love God and love your neighbor you will not steal you would not cover it you, know, you would not right. be a false witness against other people you would not do any other thing because it encompasses all of that and here's, here's it, Gary, you asked the question about Seventh-day Adventists and, and our claims about being the people who keep the commandments of God. The, the question ends up being, I mean, nine of the commandments, virtually no Christian is going to argue about nine of the commandments. The question is about the Sabbath commandment. We call it number four, most people call it number four, but some people renumber the commandments. It's the Sabbath commandment. And the question is, does is does it make sense to keep the Sabbath commandment? Is it make is a is a is a good thing to do, uh, based on your relationship with God? Seventh Day Adventists would say absolutely, because that is our that's our date with God, that's our opportunity to fellowship with Him, to get to know Him better every week, and God asks us to set that. He said, "I'll set the date. You take the, you pick out the place, uh, and, and the means, the way you're going to do it." Doesn't it say that in, from Sabbath to Sabbath in the in and even in the New Earth? So we we as God's kids have a lot of learning to do, and God's had a lot of things He wants to teach. Yeah. We're going to be good. we're going to be doing a lot of learning for the rest of eternity. Of course, yeah. But that's one commandment that doesn't make any sense other than God said it. No, it does no, make sense no, because you have to have true. a teaching time, and he, He's not going to occupy all your time. He just says you need to have. One, we got to get together one time a week, and we're going to. Ch he chose the seventh day because it was because of all the meanings involved but in it. But my Sunday friends spend Sunday as a Sabbath. Yeah, well, in they the make a here's, here's here's my 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 point to you, Joanne. Ask them how they spend the full day, all 24 hours. If if they really truly are dedicating a full 24 hours to God then it'll be very easy to con convince them that it's the, the right 24 hours is Saturday and not Sunday. The difference between the people who keep Sunday and the people who keep Saturday is not, okay, I, I'm just not sure which day it is. The difference is how they keep that day. And Seventh-day Adventists would say, uh, those who are really, you know, want to be God's friends would say, the, sa the Sabbath is the best day of the week. It's the most exciting time. It's a time we have to spend with God. It's a time we get to know Him better. We do things together. We worship Him. We, we value what He teaches us. It's our chance to learn more about what he, what he has to say to us. It's our time to communicate with Him. All of those things. And that is absolutely what you do. I mean, what do you do if you're, if you're, you're dating someone, you're thinking about getting married? You want to spend as much time as possible with that person. God says, okay. Let's do it. Well, my nephew, who has gone to Sunday churches and also the Adventist church, he says the Adventists are nice to spend time with because the Sunday church, the minute church is over, boom, they're all gone. And he says the Adventists, no, they're not going anywhere, so they leisurely talk, and he likes to talk. Mm -hmm. So, Well, there's an example. <laughs> Question. Yeah. What would you say when, let's say here it's Saturday, but in other parts of the world it's Sunday or another day? Uh, so, 
is it the day itself or what we do and is it just about you know spending time with God because we should really spend some time with God every day in my view yes. but also Sabbath is a time when we corporately yes. come and honor God yes yeah and and God is not saying okay there's a certain period of time that is different you know the rain on this at this time of this time of the week is 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 is, is, has, is better or it has more fertilizer with it or it makes plants grow bigger and stronger than it does on another day no God is saying we have a time and and, and uh, God knew perfectly well that this is a round world and he understands that that Saturday's going to come at a different time for different people in different parts of the world. God says, that's not the point in my commandment. My commandment is, I want to have a date with you. Pick your Saturday. And the reason he, he asked for us to pick a full day is, is exactly what Joanne was talking about. If, if he doesn't do that, and if we don't follow, I mean, I could go through the whole Sabbath thing and explain why God did it exactly the way he did, because... That's what we, we, we do if we really want to spend time with him. We're not rushing off to w go to the football game or something else like that. So, anyway, so we come back here to Galatians, verse, Galatians 2, verse 17. If then, as we try to be put right with God by our union with Christ, we are found to be sinners as much as the Gentiles are, does this mean that Christ is serving the cause of sin? And in Romans, because we're always comparing back and forth, how many people are sinners? Everybody. 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 Romans 3, 23. By no means. If I start to rebuild the system of law that I tore down, then I show myself to be someone who breaks the law. So far as the law is concerned, I mean, if you've torn it down, are you breaking it or what? Right? So far as the law is concerned, however, I am dead, killed by the law itself, in order that I might live for God. I've been put to death with Christ on his cross so that it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Paul has said, and if you remember in, in Romans, I'm sorry, in Corinthians, we've already read, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he just said, imitate me as I do what? Imitate Christ. Imitate Christ. And what's he saying here? I, I don't understand. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. What does he mean, die to the law? He's, he's saying he recognizes that he, he, it's, he, he could not accomplish what needed to be done by keeping the law. He recognized as a Pharisee that he, he never could ever keep all those rules that they had. Say. He just says, you know, if, if my salvation depends upon keeping all those rules, I'm, de I'm a dead man. So he accepted that he was not perfect. Yes. He, and that was kind of a revelation. Yeah. So he said, now, I instead of taking the approach that I trust in God, I have faith in God to make the changes in me that are necessary. So that's what we have here. I've been put to death uh, with Christ on his cross, so there's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. If my life can be the way I want it to do, it'll be like Jesus shining out through my life. Um, it's very hard for some people to realize they're not perfect or that they need to change. Well, we all here are perfect, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I thought so. Um, this life that I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God and who loved me and gave his life for me. I refuse to reject the grace of God. But if a person is put right with God through the law, it means that Christ died for nothing. In other words, he's saying, if it's possible to earn salvation by keeping the law, then there was no reason for Jesus to come and die. He, sh he should have just told us, keep the law and you can be saved by keeping the law. So if, if that would be the system, then no, not one would get to heaven. Yeah, exactly. So now he's, 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 he's finally he's going to say, okay, Galatians, let me tell you what I think. You foolish Galatians. I think Philip says, you dear idiots of Galatia. <laughs> <laughs> but says, the dear part is very important. Yes? It says, who has bewitched you? Yeah. Who put a spell on you, my version says. Before your very eyes, you had a clear description of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
Why does he mention that? Because their vision came <coughs> from within them instead of from the outside. Okay. A clear vision, yeah. right? But what is it? I mean, what, what's the vision about? The death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Why is that the central part of the gospel? That is the gospel. <laughs> okay. Jesus didn't have to die on the cross if we were not sinners. Yeah, and furthermore, what Jesus accomplished by his death on the cross, by refuting all of Satan's accusations and answering all of Satan's questions, so that nobody in the rest of the universe has any questions anymore, they are convinced, they know the truth about God now. So, by his death on the cross, Jesus basically ended the great controversy as far as the rest of the universe is concerned. Now, the other beings in heaven uh, thought that God was a bad person, but when Jesus died on the cross because of what Satan did, uh, Satan caused people to kill Jesus, then the, the beings in heaven knew that Satan was not a nice guy anymore. He was really a murderer. Okay, let's, let's, I would say that a little differently. When Satan was still up in heaven, Lucifer, back before earth was created, he convinced a third of the angels, living in the very presence of God, to rebel against God and not to trust him. That seems, it just, it just blows my mind every time I think about it, how that's possible. Well, it kind of scares me. If I was an angel in heaven, would I have been so stupid yeah. to be in the third? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what many people don't stop and think about is the other two-thirds must have had some questions. You, you can be sure that Satan just didn't just work on one-third. He, right he tried to work on all of them. He convinced a third, but the others was, well... Maybe there are some questions. Maybe, 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 maybe. So those questions had to be resolved. And Christ, well, first of all, by his, the way he created us and put us in the Garden of Eden back in the beginning, and then down through history as they saw everything that happened, and finally, especially through his life and death on this earth, all of Satan's accusations. Satan had said, no human being can ever live a perfect life without sinning. Jesus did it. Satan had said, you know, no one, if a person dies, they belong to me. That's it. Finished. And Jesus says, watch. He died the first death. He died the second death. We've, we've talked about that before, and we'll, we'll talk about it more when we get into Romans. He died both the first death and the second death, and he still rose out of death and went back to heaven, proving that Satan doesn't have the power to, to, to control all the dead. Otherwise, of course, none of us have a chance. If we die... See, if Satan is right and we die, we're, we're finished. Didn't Satan also say that God was uh, selfish and did not love? And yeah. the beings in heaven saw God himself hanging on the cross and knew that that was not yeah. correct, that God, does, God is love. Yeah. Well, another thing is that we didn't anger him. No. He, he stuck with the plan, what, what the Father had told him to do. And when it was all over with, he still loved us. Mm -hmm. so he is Jesus? Jesus, yeah. As God, also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why when people say, like, Satan caused people to kill Jesus, sometimes I don't like that term too much, because Jesus said, no one took my life. I mm -hmm. gave it freely. I mm -hmm. g he gave his life freely for us. It wasn't just Satan. Satan wasn't in control in that. No, no, mm -hmm. no. Those that wanted to kill him weren't going to get the satisfaction of doing so. Yeah. So but, the uh, better way to say it is Satan yeah. caused people to beat Christ up quite a bit and yes. to nail him to a cross. Yeah. But, but Christ laid his down life. He Christ. expelled the last well, breath willingly. Yeah. He agreed to go through that whole experience. He died because of separation from God. That's, that's what really killed him. My God, God, is, God why have you forsaken yeah. me? God is the source of life. And if you get separated from that source of life, you're finished. If you unplug yourself, you no longer, yep. your yep. computer no longer works, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, starting from chapter 3, verse 2, now let's work our way down here. Tell me this one thing. Did you receive God's Spirit by doing what the law requires or by hearing the gospel and believing? 
And Paul knew the answer to that, and he was sure the Galatians knew the answer to that also. How can you be so foolish? You began by God's Spirit. Do you now want to finish by your own power? Did all your experience mean nothing at all? Surely it meant something. Does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you because you do what the law requires or because you hear the gospel and believe it? So here's the difference between trying to work your way to salvation or accepting by faith the truth that God presents. Consider the experience of Abraham. As the scripture says, he believed God and was up, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. By the way, was that before or after he was circumcised? Before. Before he was circumcised. So Abraham was not a perfect person. But he made a few mistakes. He, he lied about mistakes. his wife. Yeah. But he had a lot of faith in God. He had faith in God. And then God said, you're my righteous person because you trust me and believe in me. Yep. Not because you're a rule follower. Yeah. You should realize then that the real descendants of Abraham are the people who have faith, just as Abraham did. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham, through you, God will bless all the people. Abraham believed and was blessed, so all who believe are blessed as he was. So it is saying that we are Abraham's seed, mm -hmm. so it, our, our, we come through Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, and the Gentiles can say that as well as the Jews yes. then. Okay. Yes. So Paul is really saying, it's not the, the DNA in your, in your blood that makes a difference. It's your relationship to Jesus Christ. It's your relationship to the truth. If we have faith in Jesus, then we are of Abraham's seed. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, he goes on to say that. Look at verse 10. Those who depend on obeying the law, they depend for salvation upon obeying the law, live under a curse. For the scripture says, whoever does not always obey everything. Yoli, here you go. Those who do not always obey everything that is written in the book of the law is under God's curse. Now it is clear that no one is put right with God by means of the law because the scripture says only the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. But the law has nothing to do with faith. Instead, as the scripture says, whoever does everything the law requires will live. So once again, let's, let's admit it. If you could fully and completely <coughs> comply with all of God's requirements, you could live by it, but you can't. But by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings by showing us exactly what happens when you remain as a sinner. Christ became a sinner, 1 Corinthians 5, 21. Christ became a sinner in order that, you know, he didn't, you know, he, he, he acted the part of a sinner. Maybe let's be careful. I don't want to say he was a sinner, but he, he was treated as a sinner in order to show us what happens to sinners. The Father treated Jesus like he will treat sinners. He yeah. let him go. Mm -hmm. So, um, but by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who's hanged on a tree is under God's curse. Christ did this in order that the blessing which God promised Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of Christ Jesus so that through faith, we might receive the Spirit promised by God. My friends, I'm going to use an everyday example. When two people agree on a matter and sign an agreement, no one can break it or add anything to it. Now, God made this promise, his promises to Abraham and to his descendant, singular. This scripture does not use the plural descendants, meaning many people, but the singular descendant, meaning one person only, namely Christ. So the, 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 the original agreement between Ab was between Abraham and whom? God. God, okay? And that, that agreement was, was agreed upon 400 plus years before the Sinai law was given. So Abraham is saying, okay, God may have come down on a mountain. He may have given commandments and so forth, but it no, doesn't matter what he did at that point in time, that other agreement, it was in place 400 years before, and nobody can come along and change it by anything. You can't say, okay, now 
you, you, you can stop doing that. Now you can do this other thing. You can keep these laws and that will take the place of that. No, that agreement, that covenant is still there and it's still in place and nobody can change that fact. Why did Paul use Sarah and Hagar as an illustration of God's <coughs> two covenants? Well, we're getting that to that in chapter chapter four here. We'll, we'll talk more about that. So you know maybe you can just hold that for a moment. What's interesting is a lot of people uh, check, is it genealogy where you look back at your ancestors and stuff? Uh, well, I know my genealogy has nothing but European dirt farmers. And so I don't have any kings, queens, or whatever people are finding. But it feels really good to be, to have this rich Jewish history Mm -hmm. and to be part of it as a Gentile, yeah. to be part of the seed of Abraham. And to me, that is a more important genealogy than going back and trying to figure out, and yeah. really, who can even figure out? You don't even know if these people kept proper records sure. or, or even messed around and had you know kids out of whatever, wedlock and stuff. Yeah. So, uh, but it feels really good to have a rich genealogy mm -hmm because mm -hmm. the Jewish people have such a rich history. Mm -hmm. Well, going on, the law which is given 400 years, let's see, verse 17, I guess. What I mean is that God made a covenant with Abraham. This is a promise, an agreement, and promised to keep it. The law which was given 430 years later cannot break that promise, that covenant, that agreement, and cancel God's promise. For if God's gift depends on the law, given 400 years later, then it no longer depends on his promise. However, it was because of his promise that God gave the gift to Abraham. And now, Carrie, the verses you read us, what then was the purpose of the law? It was added in order to show what wrongdoing is, and it was meant to last until the coming of Abraham's descendant, to whom the promise was made. And Christians have argued and argued and argued about this verse. What law was it that was added? And there's two major arguments. One argument says it was the ceremonial law. It was all those extra rules that were added, and so forth and so forth. And the other side said, no, it was the moral law. It was the Ten Commandments that was added. What, what does that mean, it was added? What do you suppose added means in this context? They were not original. <laughs> They weren't there at the beginning, okay. What they else? They were not there in the Garden of Eden. They were not there in the Garden of Eden, okay. God told Adam, you, you better not commit adultery. Hmm, how would Adam commit adultery? <laughs> there was no one there. Well, it's kind of like, like a living room, isn't it, when you add a chair because you need it? Yeah, okay. So. Are you saying that God's people got so unruly mm -hmm. and so out of hand that he had to lay down a few laws just to maybe protect them from themselves? Well, let me put it this way, and we're running out of time here for the first half of our program. Let me put it this way. If every morning, you have a large family, let's say, and every morning, with your windows open, you have to say to your kids, now kids, I don't want any murdering on the playground today, and wife, I don't want you committing uh, 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 adultery with the mailman, da, 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 and you go down the list like this, and what are the neighbors going to think if they hear you talking like that? But There's a problem in your family, right? Well, there was a problem before you made that statement. And yeah. Because those things were probably going on. Well, the only reason to make those, those rules something is going because on. something's going on. Exactly. So God is trying to make rules to try to straighten things out. But the biggest question will be solved when we come back.
Okay, so what do you think? Was it the ceremonial law that was added, or was it the Ten Commandment law that was added? Now, to a good Jew, if you say law, and especially if you write it with a capital L, I guess I should do it that way for your benefit, um, with a capital L, you're really talking about all five of the books of Moses, the Torah. So that would be really making it broad. That would include all law. And believe it or not, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White by name, that many of you are familiar with, said, in fact, that this includes all law. And we should raise the question. Let, let me read it. Does this mean that the law is against God's promises? No, not at all, for if human beings had received a law that could bring life, then everyone could be put right with God by obeying it. But the scripture says that the whole world is under the power of sin, and so the gift which is promised on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ is, is given to those who believe. But before the time for faith came, or, well, I'll, let me read on, the law kept us all locked up as prisoners until the coming faith should be revealed. And so the law was in charge of us until Christ came. Or it could be to bring us to Christ. The Greek can go either way. In order that we might then be put right with God through faith. Now that the time for faith is here, the law is no longer in charge of us. Okay. Well, what law is no longer in charge of us? And he called it prisoners. Kept All us prisoners. prisoners. Yeah. So... Obviously, when the law goes away, we're free. Did Paul, back in the days when he was a Pharisee, feel like a prisoner? Hmm. Nope. Depends how big your jail is. <laughs> <laughs> Did the law prepare us for Christ because it made us fail again and again and again because we could not keep it again and again? Mm -hmm. And so we were ready for forgiveness and for Christ to help us um, become better people instead of trying ourselves? Well, we can't get anywhere without knowing what's, what's white right. and what's black. Mm -hmm. So if he didn't say anything, well, then we would be doing everything according to what we think is right. That's sure right? true today. And, and the example of that is in the book of, of, of Judges. Mm -hmm. All those terrible things that it says twice in the book of Judges, everybody did what, what was right in his own eyes. Well, do, we want to, do we want to go back to the Judges? In today's world, it's a bit that way. The, like my friend said, when did the Bible quit being the standard? Mm -hmm. And like some of the commercials, uh, just do it. Or um, the truth is relative, depending on what you think is right or wrong. So that... Mm -hmm. Similar. Enough. Well, this, this is basically asking us this question, I believe. Why did God, who believed so much in freedom, and Paul's going to spend the next three chapters, four, five, and six, really focusing on freedom. Why does a God who believes so much in freedom make so much use of law? Well, if you look at law as descriptive of the way things will be or the way you will conduct yourself you're in, if you're in harmony with the Creator. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we, we're, we're confined to, but with gravity and we call that a law. Mm -hmm. uh, and it works very consistently and fortunately it works very consistently because you know if I let go of something it's not going to fly off at an angle, it's going to go down. So it's very comfortable to know that uh, if people are not going to be stealing from you or not going to be beating up on you and, and so on and so forth. That's that's the way it was meant to be. What would it be like to live in a society where everyone fully and completely kept all ten of the Ten Commandments? Including, Inclu including number the ninth, ten. The, the tenth one. Because the tenth one just says they don't even want to do what's wrong. Well, you know, when I was growing up, I lived in a home that didn't really have much guidance. And I really envied the kids whose parents took the time to give them guidance and laws and rules that allowed them to be better people a lot quicker than learning by the school of hard knocks. Mm -hmm. So I believe that you give your kids a lot more freedom by teaching them how to live so that they um, prosper and, ha and, and just 
learn to do things right. Yeah. And um, I, I like the way the, the New American Standard has it here. It says, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. And then a little further down it says, but now faith has come. We are no longer under a tutor. We are all sons of God through faith. Yeah. And we should take just a moment to talk about that word tutor. The Greek word is paidagogos. And a paidagogos was a trusted servant, probably even a slave in many cases. And the, the, the job of this slave was to do the following. Unfortunately, in, in Paul's day, there was not only the tendency for kids to, to forget their, what they were supposed to be doing and wander off and play in the mud puddles and that kind of stuff, but there was also the hazard, especially if you were a wealthy family, that your kids would be kidnapped and held for ransom. So this trusted slave, his job would be to escort the kids to school, making sure they were safe and that they were going straight to school like they were supposed to. He would presumably stay at school so that when the kids came out to play in recess and whatever like this, they would still be safe. And when it came time to get, go home, he would escort them safely directly home. Well, okay, what's the function of the law? The law, the function of the law is to keep us safe when we don't know enough to do what's right because it is right. When we, when we get to the place where we understand what's right and we do what's right because it is right, we don't need the law anymore. That's exactly, exactly what, was, what the law did. So it's, it's an excellent example of what the law does. So you got three positions. You got the judge's type of position. You got people that keep a law. And then you got people that live by faith. Mm -hmm. So there's, the Bible has gone through all those yes. progressions. Those progressions, yeah. But don't people who live by faith also need a tutor, or? Well, it, it turns out that uh, all of us need instruction. Yeah. So we should, even if we we've, we've gone past that point, we can still learn lessons from by looking back. But going on with verse 26, it is through faith that all of you are God's children in union with Christ Jesus. All of you are God's children. You were baptized into union with Christ and now you are clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. And I always smile when I read this verse. I love this verse. Uh, Paul knew that one of the favorite pharisaical prayers of Jewish males was what? Rise in the morning, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman, in that order. Thank you. I have a question for all of you who were baptized into Christ. Okay, what if Your members. some people were not baptized? I mean, is he talking about actual baptism? Do you he's, have to be actually baptized? I know a lot of churches who do not baptize. Yeah, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit here, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Not a dunking into water. No. Well, if you belong to Christ, and this is your, supports your point you are talking about a moment ago, Joanne, if you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. And going right on, Paul didn't stop. There were no chapter, no verse breaks in Paul's day. But now to continue, the son who will receive his father's property is treated just like a slave while he is young. He has, even has to have someone take him to school and bring him home again, right? Um, even though he really owns everything. While he is young, there are men who take care of him and manage his affairs until the time set by his father. In the same way, we too were slaves of the ruling spirits of the universe before we reach spiritual maturity. Would those be the, the demonic influences? But when the right time finally came, God sent his own son. He came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law so, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might become God's children. To show that you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who cries out, Father, my father. So then, you are no longer a slave, but a child. And since you are his child, God will give you all that he has for his children. So Paul is just going right through the logical stuff here. You well, know, he's making a case for mm -hmm. his version of the good news is better than the right. Judaizers. Exactly, exactly. 
Well, he goes on here, and I'm not sure we have time to read all of this, but in, in Paul's concern for the grace in the past, you did not know God, and so you were slaves of beings who are not gods. Dropping down to verse 12, I beg you, my friends, be like me. After all, I am like you. You have not done me any wrong. You remember why I preached the gospel to you the first time? It was because I was sick, and so forth. And then verse 15, you were so happy. What has happened? I myself say that you would have taken out your own eyes if you could and given them to me. This is a strong argument in favor of the idea that Paul's thorn in the flesh was his poor eyesight. Mm. Um, so these he, other he, he, he's saying that he might have needed new eyes yeah. and they might have given him their eyes. Okay. Yeah. Those other people show a deep interest in you, but their intention is not good. They just want to rack you up on their gun, another notch in the barrel of their gun. And I, I won this one. I got this one circumcised. I got this one circumcised, and so forth. Verse 19, my dear children, once again, just like a mother in childbirth, I feel the same kind of pain for you until Christ's nature is formed in you. How I wish I were with you now so that I could take a different attitude toward you. I am so worried about you. Really, I mean, he's really showing it here. Let me ask those of you who want to be subject to the law, do you not hear what the law says? It says that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman, the other by a free woman. His son by the slave woman was born the usual way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of God's promise. I mean, Sarah was way past menopause. She wasn't supposed to be having children. So the son of the slave woman Abraham actually um, arranged that encounter so that he would have a son. He did not trust that God would provide a son. Yep. And so that was considered son of the slave woman. Right. But God's... And you try to do it. Notice once again, this is the case of Abraham trying to do it himself without doing it God's way. And God really provided a miracle and mm -hmm. gave Abraham a miracle son. These two things can be understood as a figure. The woman, two women represent two covenants. The one was, whose child are, are though the one whose children are born in slavery is Hagar, and she represents the covenant made at Mount Sinai. So Paul is really going out on a limb here. He's saying, "You people who want to be saved by keeping the law given at Mount Sinai, you're children of Hagar." Hmm. Hagar, who stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia is a figure of the present city of Jerusalem in slavery. I mean, you know, what would his, what would his pharisaical friends have to say about that? Kind of disturbed. With all its people. But the heavenly Jerusalem is free, and she is our mother. For the scripture says, Be happy, you childless woman. Shout and cry for joy, you who never felt the pains of childbirth. For the woman who was deserted, will, who was deserted, will have more children than the woman whose husband never left her. Can you explain that? What in the heck did he mean there? Okay. What he's saying is that eight, for most of her life, Sarah looked like a barren woman. She didn't have a child and they tried everything. And up they were until about 90 years old? Up until she was 90 years old. Yeah. She was, she was a barren woman. And so that's, so he says, here Hagar comes along. She has one or two encounters with Abraham. She gets pregnant. She looks like, and, and, n and most of us. she was younger. Yeah, very young. We would gather around and say, look at, here's this beautiful, fertile young woman. Look at her. Now she's pregnant, etc. She's the one that God has blessed. Don't we say, you know, God has blessed you with children? So who is the cursed one? Sarah. Who's the blessed one? It looked Slave like it was Hagar. So he's saying, rejoice, Sarah. Okay. Who, do, who does not bear, break forth and shout because mm -hmm. you are going to have, and you're going to have more children than the younger one who looks like she has children. Right. Mainly because God was going to multiply the seeds of that one child. That's right. Yeah. Now you, my friends, are God's children as a result of his promise, just as Isaac was, and so forth. Um, I'm going to jump over because I want to try to finish this up if we can in the next few minutes. But it says that the one born according to the flesh is persecuting he that was born to the spirit. Well, that's just like the Judaizers were persecuting the Christians who wanted to be born of the yep. spirit. Yeah, same story. Freedom is what we have. Chapter 5. Christ has set us free. Stand then as free people and do not allow yourselves to become slaves again. 
and he goes down and talks about what freedom. Listen, I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, it means that Christ is of no use to you at all. So he's really taken on this circumcision thing. Once more, I warn any man who allows himself to be circumcised that he's obliged to obey the whole law, which, of course, Paul's already said you can't do, right? This item is again getting popular in our world. There have been a couple cities or something that either attempted or passed a law against circumcision, but it had nothing to do with any Bible. And um, against you know, circumcision. Against, yeah, like San Francisco tried to pass a law making it illegal to circumcise a baby. And I believe there is one city who has made it illegal. It's in Germany. It's Germany, in Germany. There's now, other places in the world, but it's just I'm, changing. I'm wondering, they are not doing it. For religious uh, reasons. Uh, they may be doing it even against the Bible, thinking that this is something that the Bible requires. But it seems to be taking away freedom of choice because mm -hmm. you're free to either circumcise your baby boy or not. Mm -hmm. Currently, but it's to do with political correctness. You can't mutilate somebody until they're of age to make up their own mind. But it has some health benefits. It always has had. There's good reasons why the Jews did it, apart from yeah. religion. Yeah, but There's this no is an reason. item that's coming forth in our world again. That's but but Paul, sorry. go ahead. But in parts of Africa, I'm glad that's happening because they're taking children and would get a rock and just. You know, it's, it's, and women, they're doing it to women as well, so they would not have enjoy yeah. sex yeah. and whatever. It's, it's around for centuries, it comes oh and yeah. it goes. Yeah. Well, Paul goes on talking about this, the, the, how he feels about people who are trying to require circumcision until he comes to verse 12, and he summarizes there, chapter 5, verse 12, I wish that the people who are upsetting you would go all the way, let them go on and castrate themselves. <laughs> <laughs> In one version, I think it's Phillips, that says, I wish the knife would slip. <laughs> but it's getting, it's getting pretty basic. <laughs> pretty basic, isn't it? Pretty graphic. Yeah. As for you, my friends, you were called to be free. But do not let this freedom become an excuse for letting your physical desires control you. And he says, you know, there's another side to this. For the whole law is summed up in one commandment, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And of course, that's what Jesus said, wasn't it? But if you act like wild animals hurting and harming each other, then watch out or you will completely destroy one another. And that's what happens. That's what would happen to our world if God just stepped back and let oh, Satan yes. be in charge. And let us all be as selfish as we want to be. It wouldn't be very long we'd completely destroy ourselves. What I say is this, let the Spirit direct your lives and you will not satisfy the desires of the human nature. For our, and, and now he says, let me, tr let me contrast the human with the divine. For what our human nature wants is opposed to what the Spirit wants, and what the Spirit wants is opposed to what our human nature wants. These two are enemies, and this means that you cannot do what you want to do. If the Spirit leads you, then you are not subject to the law. What human nature does is quite plain. It shows itself an immoral, filthy and indecent actions, in worship of idols and witchcraft, people become enemies and they fight, they become jealous, angry and ambitious, they separate into parties and groups, they are envious, get drunk, have orgies and do other things like these. I warn you now, as I have before, those who do these things will not possess the kingdom of God. You know, the law, we're not supposed to strive and, and um, get salvation by the law, but if we don't know what is right and what is wrong, it doesn't hurt to peek at the law to see no, no. what God's law and says. Paul, Paul says very clearly back in Romans 3.31, am I doing away with the law? Not at all. It's just you keep it for a very different reason. You don't keep it as a way of earning salvation. And you keep it by saying, God help me, God help me, mm -hmm. God help me, mm -hmm. not help myself, help myself, help myself. Yeah. So now the other side, but the Spirit produces, this is verse 20, Galatians 5, starting with verse 22, but the Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, and self-control. Very much. God's, Satan's kind of spirit comes in a bottle, doesn't it? Spirits. The old spirity shoppy, right? And no self-control. And no self-control. Okay. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have put to death their human nature with all its passion and desires. 
the Spirit has given us life, he, he must also control our lives. We must not be proud or irritate one another or be jealous of one another. Well, you know, some people, and this is the world I come from, uh, say, I don't want to be a Christian because I have to give up all the fun stuff. Yeah. And really, when you become a Christian, sitting in a bar drinking yourself to a stupor no longer is fun. And it's fun helping with a potluck or something yeah. like that. And so God changes you that the things that you thought were fun and you didn't want to leave, like I could never give up my cigarettes, they'd say. And, and, but then God makes you say, oh, how could I ever smoke those? And so God gives you fun in a different way. And yeah, it's better fun. Yeah. So, so where yeah. are we at now? We're, at We're almost ready for chapter six. Yeah. Okay. I think that to sort of sum it up, the good things that we just finished with, it says also, against such things there is no law. Yeah. If you look at all the other stuff, deeds of the flesh, you can go to any society today, there's some very definite laws <laughs> against it. Yeah. God knew what he was doing. My friends, if, uh, chapter 6, if someone is caught in any kind of wrongdoing, those of you who are spiritual should set him right. In other words, we're not here to start judging other people. We need to help out e other people. But you must do it in a gentle way and keep an eye on yourselves so that you will not be tempted to. Help carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will obey the law of Christ. If you think that you are something when you really are nothing, you're only deceiving yourselves. So we can only help somebody as far as it will not injure ourselves. And yes, and we're not. It's we're, God didn't give us the job of judging people. That's not our job. He does. He's the judge. And you should each judge your own conduct. We need to do that. Verse four. If it is good, then you can be proud of what you yourself have done, without having to compare it with that what someone else has done. For each of you have to carry your own load. If you're being taught the Christian message, you should share all the good things you have with your teacher. Do not deceive yourselves. And this is a very important verse from Galatians. Do not deceive yourselves. No one makes a fool of God. Now, what has he called the Galatians several times already? Foolish, right? It's crazy. No one makes a fool of God. You will reap exactly what you plant or you, what you sow. What does he mean? a fool of God. How would they make a fool of God? Well, Or how would they think that to make Trying to set up your own rules and say, God, I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be saved by doing... And you have, to, you have to save me because look at all these things. Way back in, in Matthew 7, 21, 21, here are these people saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Haven't we done all these things to earn salvation? And God will say, what? I do not know you. Go away, I do not know you. That's what he's talking about. Well, they're accusing him of being a fool. Yeah. Also. Um, if you plant in the field of your natural desires, from it you will gather the harvest of death. If you plant in the field of the Spirit, from the Spirit you will gather the harvest of eternal life. So let us not become tired of doing good. For if we do not give up, the time will come when we will reap the harvest. So then, as often as we have the chance, we should do good to everyone, and especially to those who belong to our family in the faith. In other words, if you if you have a choice, who should you do good for? Who are the, saints. the other saints, right? Yeah. The other people in the church. Right. Charity starts at home. And then he finally ends up with this final greeting here. See what big letters I make as I write to you now with my own hand. Now we have suggested that Paul's thorn in the flesh might be his eyesight. Remember that he couldn't see at all after being struck blind there on the Damascus Road for a few days, and then those scales fell from his eyes, and he, he you know, he said, "When I came to you, I, I, you would have taken your eyes out." Galatians 4:15 and so forth. And now look at this. See what with, with, see what big letters I make as I write to you with my own hand. In other words, who's been writing so far? Yes. A secretary. That's right. Yeah, someone helping him. The, the people who are trying to force you to be circumcised are the ones who want to show off and boast about external matters. They do it, however, only so that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Even those who practice circumcision do not obey the law. They want you to be circumcised so that they can boast that you submitted to this physical ceremony. 
In other words, they know, they, they know they're not even keeping the law, but they want you to, to, to follow this as if you were keeping the law so they can notch one on their, on their, their gun barrel. So they want to be the boss rather than God? Yeah. As for me, however, I will boast only about the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, for by means of his cross, the world is dead to me, and I am dead to the world. It does not matter at all whether or not one is circumcised. What does matter is being a new creature. Yeah. And, and, wh and where do we read about being born again, being a new creature? That was Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus, Nicodemus. wasn't it? In chapter 3 of John. As for those who follow this rule in their lives, may peace and mercy be with them, with them and with all of God's people. To conclude, let no one give me any more trouble <laughs> because the scars I have in my body show that I'm a slave of Jesus. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, my friends. Amen. Amen. Thus may it, may it be so. Amen. Okay. Where does God say, I'm going to give you a heart of flesh well, and not of stone? Way back in Jeremiah. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what have we seen in the book of Galatians? What we have seen is Paul very, very disturbed because people are coming along and trying to undo all of his hard work. Work that he had, you know, he, he had risked his life to accomplish. He risked his life many times. He had been beaten. 1 Corinthians 11 tells us he was, he was beaten by the Jews. He was beaten by the Romans. He, he was shipwrecked, da, 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 on and on and on and on, like this. But he says, I did all this for your benefit. And don't, you see, these people who come around trying to boast about you because they get, they're going to get you to circum be circumcised, you don't need all that stuff. What you need is faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, the law that really matters is the law of love. Learn to love the, tr the truth about God, learn to love God, learn to love your fellow man, and you will be, by faith, you will walk the path that, that God intends. He gave all those rules not so that he could, he could lord it over us. Are you doing all these rules? No. He gave them because we needed them. We were making all kinds of mistakes, and God says, you need to stop doing those things so it's not good for you. I hope you enjoyed the book of Galatians as we have. See you next week.